Good evening, we're learning Parshat Beshalach. Parshat Beshalach really starts <coughs> um, in the previous Parsha. Beshalach means when Paro sent the Jewish people out. But the, really, the, he sent them out in Parashat Bo. And in Parashat Bo, we read on page 359 in Art Scroll that Egypt imposed itself strongly upon the people to hasten to send them out of the land. For they said, we're all dying. So the Egyptians are pushing the Jewish people. Until now, for 210 years, they were holding on, not letting them go. Even to bury Yaakov, who, who passed away, it was such a big deal. They had to ask special permission to take the dead body out. And for sure, Egyptians don't want to let any living person out of, of their country. And here they're saying, leave, and they're pushing them. And the people picked up their dough before it could become leaven, before it became chametz, and they went. And they took silver and gold utensils and garments from the Egyptians. They borrowed them, pretending to borrow them. And the Egyptians were so afraid and so... Uh, they were they they kept held Jewish people in such esteem by now that they said yes of course it's going to be our honor take everything and the Exodus began the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot their first stop was Sukkot first the Jewish people all of them assembled from the entire Egypt they came to Ramses and uh, some say it was, was a miraculous. Uh, transport on eagle's wings to bring all the Jewish people to Ramses and then they traveled to Sukkot a place called Sukkot 600,000 men plus children plus women plus elderly plus babies right now also a mixed multitude went up with them and their animals and the 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 now we come back to the continuation of the story yes they went out from ramses to sukkot and then what happened we're on page 367 of the art school humash it happened when paro sent out the people that god did not lead them by the way of the land of pelishtim of philistines now here we see how Hashem is orchestrating all the events. First of all, we read in the last week's Parsha, just now, that the Jewish people borrowed vessels, gold and silver, and garments from the Egyptians. Now, Hashem said it for two reasons. Number one, He wants the Jewish people to become rich and to be paid for all the hard labor they did for 210 years. But there's a second reason, and that is so that the Egyptians start regretting. Why did we let them go? And not only we let them go, we gave them our gold and silver and precious garments. They told us they're going to borrow it and they're not coming back. We want our money back. So Hashem wanted the Egyptians to become angry to regret that they send the Jews and to run after them. Hashem wanted it to happen. This is a lesson for us that whenever the non-Jews attack us, it's not by chance. It's not because they decided so. It's because Hashem arranged it so that they should be inspired to attack the Jews. Sometimes it is because of the fault of the Jew. When the Jew is going away from God, so Hashem sends a goy, a non-Jew, to chase him back to God. But like it happened in this case, sometimes a non-Jew attacks a Jew in order for the Jew to see that God will protect him. To see the greatness of Hashem. So Hashem really wants that the Egyptians should run after the Jews because He wants to give them one last makkah, one last hit. But the Egyptians are scared. They don't want to pursue the Jews. They don't want to get hurt. So Hashem has to incite them. And one way that He incites them is that they give away their money to the Jews and now they regret they want their money back and the second 
way Hashem incites them is because it says it happened when Paro sent out the people. Hashem made Paro think that he let the Jewish people go of his own free choice. Paro didn't realize that it was not his choice anymore. If he would not let them go, he would die and his entire country would perish. But Hashem made it look like it was his choice and since he allowed them to go, now he can change his mind and bring them back. Because Paro is uh, thinking that it's not God who took them out, it's me. I let them go. That's the second way Hashem turns the screws in Paros and in Egyptians' brains in order to convince them to pursue the Jews. The third way Hashem convinces the Egyptians is because Hashem did not lead them by the way of the land of Pelishtim because it was near. He did not lead them on a straight path from Egypt north through the, the sector Gaza all the way into the land of Israel. Instead, Hashem said, the second reason, perhaps people will reconsider, maybe the Jewish people themselves, if it's so easy to go up, maybe they'll go down the same way. When they see a war, when they have to fight a single war, they might get scared and they will return to Egypt. So for these two reasons, in order to cause Paro to um, think that the Jewish people are lost, that's why they're not going straight, they're going zigzag, Paro should think that he has a chance to catch them. And number two, in order to, so that the Jewish people should lose their way back, they shouldn't find it so easy to come back. For these two reasons, verse 18 says, God turned the people toward the way of the wilderness to the Sea of Reeds. Instead of going to Israel, Hashem turns them to go to southeast. You're supposed to go north and you're going southeast. And he's taking him towards the sea of reeds. The famous sea that is going to split soon. Why is Hashem taking them towards the sea of reeds? For the same reason. Hashem wants the Egyptians to think that they are lost. And they can catch them. Where they will be stuck by the sea. The Egyptian army is going to come. And catch the Jews and the Jews will have no way to run and Hashem is arranging this whole situation to trick Egyptians to think that the Jews are trapped because he really wants to punish the Egyptians and he really wants the Jewish people to see his power and his love for us so the children of Israel were armed when they went up from Egypt. Now this word in Hebrew is Hamushim. If you read in English, what you see is what you get. They were armed. They carried weapons. Why does the Torah need to tell us that they carried weapons? For two reasons. Number one, to tell us that even though they had weapons, they did not need to use them in the fight against Egyptians because Hashem took care of them. The Jewish people did not need to use their own might. They could have, but they did not need because Hashem took care of our enemies. And the second reason we need to know that the Jewish people had weapons is because soon after the splitting of the sea, they will fight Amalekites, the people of Amalek, the evil nation. And uh, it says that they slaughtered them by the edge of the sword. Most of them at least. So we will ask a question. The Jewish people were slaves. They ran away from Egypt. Where did the weapons come from? And so the Torah informs us, yes, they took weapons with them. But in Hebrew, the word Hamushim 
also comes from the word Hamesh. And Hamushim means fifth. And one fifth of the Jewish people came out of Egypt. What does it mean? And our sages say that only one fifth of the entire Jewish nation deserved to exit. And only one fifth of the Jewish people wanted to leave. 80% of the Jews remained in Egypt and died there during the plague of darkness. That means that when we read that there were 600,000 adult males leaving Egypt and together with children and with women and with elderly, we estimate about 3 million people, that means it is only one-fifth. How many Jews were in Egypt as slaves? Must be there were 15 million Jews in Egypt. That's a huge number. This is the same number as the number of Jews now. Right now, according to most estimates, there are 15 million Jews in the United States. And there were, I'm sorry, in the entire world. Six in the United States, uh, seven in Israel, plus another couple million around the world. Just like we started with 15 million Jews three and a half thousand years ago, we are still with the same 15 million Jews three and a half thousand later, three and a half thousand years later. While the Chinese during the same time they went from 15 million to one and a half billion. And the Indians from the same number went almost to one billion. But the Jewish people stayed throughout the entire history of the Jewish nation. They stayed on the same number. When we were in Egypt, we were 15 million people. We lost 80%. We gained them slowly through the Jewish commonwealth, the, the, the country of the land of Israel. Then again, we lost 10 tribes out of 12 or out of 13. We lost again 80% of our population. Then again, slowly we gained it. Then again, through inquisition and pogroms, we lost many millions. And then again, we regained it. And again, through the Holocaust, we lost 6 million. And now again, we regained it. And we're back at 15 million. And our sages say, and it is painful to repeat, that at the end of times, when Mashiach will come, how many people will merit how many people will survive to see Mashiach and to go to the land of Israel and see the redemption? They say history will repeat itself. And again, 80% of the Jews around the world, including America and including Israel, will not survive. Only 20% of the entire Jewish population will survive. Not only that, to make things fair, our sages say that two-thirds of the entire world will also not survive. In the war of Gog and Magog, only one-third of the world will remain. It's difficult to say, but it's not so hard to imagine anymore. With nuclear weapons, everything is possible now and even though we have seven or eight billion people we might find chas v'shalom ourselves with only two billion people and surprisingly if we look at potential people who might survive the war of Gog and Magog there's only one criteria and that is whoever wants to survive Whoever wants to go to the land of Israel. And the land of Israel as opposed to state of Israel. Land of Israel, the land of Torah, the land of the sages, the land of God, the land of Judaism. Whoever 
believes in God, whoever serves God, whoever is committed to God, and whoever wants to be redeemed and leave everything he has here and go to the land of Israel will be granted opportunity. However, whoever doesn't believe in God, whoever doesn't keep Torah, whoever doesn't want to leave his wealth and go to Israel, whoever doesn't believe in Mashiach will have to remain, which means they will remain and perish chas v'shalom voluntarily. It's their own choice. They don't want to go to Israel, so they're not going to go. And even people who are in Israel, but are dreaming to leave and to, to come to the United States, as we know, unfortunately, majority of Israelis want to live in America. And there are over 1 million Israelis living in America. Israeli citizens, they're living in America. Why so many? The truth is that another 5 million Israelis want to move to America because that's their goal to be like all the nations and, and, uh, and uh, make great wealth. But those Jews who love Israel and want to stay in Israel will be allowed to. So it's a, it's a difficult prediction, but the prophecy says that just like the Jewish people lost 80% by the exodus, by the redemption from Egypt, we will also lose 80% by the final redemption, by the war of Gog and Magog. Now, we are on verse 19. Moshe took the bones of Yosef with him. Because Yosef made the Jewish people promise that when God redeems you, take my bones out of Egypt. Now, how did they travel? They tr first, we know they travel from Ramses to Sukkot. Now, verse 20 said, says they travel from Sukkot and encamped in Etam, at the edge of the wilderness. Now they're by the wilderness, desert. They left the inhabited area. What's going to be? How are they going to be protected? And right away, Hashem provides the solution. Verse 21, Hashem went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them on the way. This cloud was a divine cloud. It would smoothen the way for them. All the ditches and mountains would become flat and smooth, like paved. And it would kill all the scorpions and snakes and wild animals on the path. And it would protect them on all sides from uh, hot sun and from cold nights. And it would also protect them on top. It would be a canopy to protect them from sunlight and from rain. And, by the way, it would also show them where to go. Where the clouds would, would move, that's where the Jewish people would go. And by night, Hashem went before them in a pillar of fire to give them light. A pillar of fire at night to lead them on the way so that they could travel by day and by night. Now we turn to page 369. Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, Speak to the children of Israel and let them turn back and encamp at Piachirot between Migdol and the Sea of Reeds before Baal Tzifon, that's the name of an idol. You should encamp opposite the idol by the sea. Now the Jewish people are confused. What is this? We're traveling and now we have to turn back and we have to be next to this idol between the idol and the sea. What did we forget there? Are we going to the beach? Why are we by the sea? And Hashem explains, verse 3, Paro will say of the children of Israel, they are imprisoned in the land. They are locked in. 
the wilderness has locked them in. They don't know where to go. This is again to trick Paro. I shall strengthen the heart of Paro and he will pursue them. And I will be glorified through Paro and his entire army. And Egypt will know that I am Hashem. And so they did. They listened to Hashem and they put themselves in a vulnerable position. They had the sea at their back. They cannot retreat. They're stuck. Why did God ask them to encamp opposite of the idol? In order for Paro to think that this idol overpowered God, Chas Shalom, and that it kept the Jews from going. And now Paro, the idol worshiper that he is, is going to worship this idol and ask him to deliver the Jewish people in his hand. And because Paro is going to serve the idol, he will think that he will succeed. And that will give him further courage so that when the sea splits, he will blindly go into the sea to be covered. So Hashem is carefully arranging everything for the ultimate downfall of Paro's arm, army. It was now, the action begins. It was told to the king of Egypt that the people had fled. Six days passed and the Jewish people are not coming back. The Jewish people told Paro, we're only going three days there. We're going to serve God and then three days back. Six days passed. They're nowhere in sight. The heart of Paro and his servants became transformed regarding the people. They understood that they were tricked, that they were taken advantage of. They were being lied to. And they are upset, rightfully so. And the heart of Paro and his servants became transformed regarding the people. They said, what is this that we have done? We have sent away Israel from serving us. Such a huge nation. And as we calculated, there were 15 million Jews in Egypt. How is it possible? There were less Egyptians than 15 million. There were no 15 million. And some historians say, yes, that is true. There were more slaves in Egypt than there were free people. And therefore, it makes sense that there were many more Jews in Egypt than Egyptians. And that is why Paro got scared. The, the Jewish nation is so numerous. If they just rebel, they're going to overthrow us. We cannot control such a mob. Because, yes, there were more Jews in Egypt than Egyptians. And that's why the Egyptians are saying, how foolish can we be? Why did we let such a good workforce out of Egypt? So, Paro harnessed his chariot and took his people with him by convincing them that I will reward you. You will be able to choose from the spoils of war anything you want. Now, we describe his powerful army. He took 600 elite chariots and plus all the chariots of Egypt with officers on all of them. He pursued the children of Israel. But the children of Israel were going out with an upraised arm. Upraised arm is a symbol of freedom. It is a symbol of going out not as slaves, humbly trying to run away, but as free people, proud and unafraid. Now, verse 9 page 369 Egyptians pursued them and overtook them it took Egyptians just a single day to catch the Jews who have been traveling for six days already and the Jews were encamped by the sea they were just relaxing in the camp all the horses and chariots of Paro and his horsemen and army now we turn to page 371 Paro approached and the children of Israel raised their eyes, and behold, Egyptians are journeying towards them. 
and they were very frightened nation of civilians children women elders with their animals with their possessions not prepared for war they cried out to Hashem and they complained to Moshe were there no graves in Egypt that you took us out in wilderness why this whole show and this escape if we're going back and we're gonna die right now what did you do to us to take us out of Egypt it would be better for us to be slaves in Egypt than to die over here. And Moshe said to people, do not fear. Stand strong and see the salvation of Hashem that He sh will perform for you today. For as you have seen Egypt today, you shall not see them again. From here we derive a negative commandment that we are not allowed to go to Egypt Because Moshe said, you're not going to see Egyptians again. Now, some say that this only applied to that generation who actually came from Egypt. And some say that this only applied while the ancient Egyptians lived in Egypt. Nowadays, it's not the Egyptians, it's the Arabs that live in e Egypt. And therefore, it is permitted to go. And Moshe reassures them. Verse 14. Hashem shall make war for you. And you shall remain silent. You don't need to do anything. Don't even pray. Don't cry. Just stand patiently, quietly, and watch what's going to happen. And Hashem said to Moshe, Why are Jewish people crying to me? Speak to them and let them journey. Everything's taken care of. They can just continue on their way through the sea. And you lift up your staff and stretch out your arm over the sea and split it. And the children of Israel shall come into the midst of the sea on dry land. Now turn to page 373. And I will be glorified through Paro. Hashem wants the Jewish people and the entire world to see His power. And that is why He is enticing Paro and Egyptians to come into the sea towards their own death. Now, the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them where it was leading them and went behind them, which means the pillar of cloud stood between the Egyptians and the Jewish people to protect them. The Egyptians started shooting arrows and throwing spears and they would get stuck in the cloud and some of them would even bounce back and hit Egyptians and there were cloud and darkness on the side of Egyptians because the night came and there was a pillar of cloud on the side of the Jews so they had light but the e Egyptians had darkness while it illuminated the night for the Jews. And that's how they spent the night. Jews next to the sea, Egyptians on the other side with a cloud in between. Egyptians submerged in darkness, Jewish people having light. Verse 21. Moshe stretched out his hand over the sea. And Hashem moved the sea with a strong east wind all the night Hashem did not make an open miracle the Mo Moshe stretches his hand and all of a sudden the sea splits not like the movie but rather he made both the Jews and the Egyptians think that the wind split the sea so that the Jews will be tested will they trust God and go into the sea and the Egyptians will think that it just happened. There was a strong wind that split the sea and it's safe to go. And they will go in, not realizing that it's Hashem who split the sea. The children of Israel came within the sea on dry land. 
and the water was a wall for them on their right and on their left. They were walking through